Welcome uh, to Dartmouth Leading Voices in Energy, Sustainability, and Security. My name is Aaron Manser. I'm an associate professor in the economics department here. And um, before I introduce today's speaker, I just wanted to remind everyone that we'll be having a series of talks in this room, 4 o'clock on Thursdays. So next week's speaker will be James Manuel on wind energy resistance in New England and beyond. Today, uh, we're going to have the pleasure of um, talking with Dan Riker, who is a professor in the practice at Stanford Law. He is um, the executive director of the Steyer uh, Taylor Center for Energy Policy and Finance at Stanford. He's also a senior advisor on the Atlantic Wind Connection, um, a joint venture with, uh, uh, with Google, a member of the National Academy of Science, a chairman of the, the board of uh, American Council of Renewable Energy. Prior to coming to Stanford, uh, Mr. Riker, or Professor Riker rather, worked at Google as a director of climate change and energy initiatives, has worked in the Clinton administration as the assistant secretary of energy for energy efficiency and renewable energy, and is the, was the president and co-founder of New Energy Capital. He's also um, been a professor at other uh, universities, uh, at, Ver at uh, Yale and um, at Vermont Law, where I uh, first met him um, some time ago. Uh, of course, before all that, and, and perhaps I should say most importantly, he's an alum. He was a, a student here, uh, graduating as a biology major in 1978, and uh, has a, a law degree from Stanford as well. So uh, with no further ado, let's welcome our speaker. Thank you, Aaron, for that <clears throat> kind introduction and uh, all the great work you do here at, at Dartmouth. Um, thank you, Andy Friedland, another terrific professor here who has helped with my visit. And I just had a wonderful experience with Andy's class. And, some of whom are sitting here in the, in the front row. So thank you so much for that. Yeah, it better be all of them are sitting Oh, there. all of them. <laughs> yes, they are all here. Otherwise, bad things will happen. We know that. Um, thank you, President Hanlon. I had a wonderful half hour with the new president today. We talked about a lot of things, and most importantly, uh, the whole world of energy and climate work here at Dartmouth. And I have to say, Dartmouth is very lucky, I think, to have President Hanlon. Um, Thank you all for coming on this extraordinarily uh, climatically challenged day. I expected you all to be in the river swimming, so I appreciate your attendance. And finally, where is my dear wife, Carol? Ooh, she is not here. <laughs> she, got so, she got so excited about the global health program and being able to sit in on classes today that we may have, we may have lost her. But in any event, she may show up. And I will finally say that we have a daughter uh, Haley Riker, who will be starting here as a freshman. Um, and we did scope out her dorm last night and send her a picture. So <laughs> any event, let's, um, let's get going. And uh, so your vocation is life is where your greatest joy meets the world's greatest need. I saw this quote recently, and I was very compelled by it. And let me tell you three quick things about my own path to to this meeting today. Um, I actually got started in this whole energy and environmental field when I was seven. It was a very lucky experience. I loved the out of doors. And at a very early age, I started reading camping catalogs. And I was reading one one day, and they were selling a parka trimmed in Wolverine fur. And that day in second grade, I had learned that the Wolverine was an endangered species. And I said to my mother, how can they be selling this? And she said, well, write them a letter. And I wrote them a letter. And a week later, they sent me a letter back saying they had discontinued the sale of this parka. And I said, boy, that's easy. <laughs> you know, what? that's cool. You know, advocacy, and you get, you get the job done. So fast forward, I was here as an undergraduate, um, studied biology. My dear friend Celia Chen, a classmate, also biology major, and now a professor here at Dartmouth. Um, got done in 1979, and I said, you know, what am I going to do? One day, the Three Mile Island accident occurred, 
And as many of you know, John Kemeny was president then. He was appointed by President Carter to chair President Carter's commission on the accident at Three Mile Island. I said, boy, now that's an opportunity. I stood in his parking space one cold day and said, President Kemeny, I'd love to work for you. Is there any way? And he said, well, you know, go, go talk to them. We didn't have a long conversation. I called my mother and she said, well, I'll buy you a plane ticket, fly down there and go talk to the folks at the commission. So I flew down, knocked on the door and they said, you know, you're just a college graduate. The only thing we have is you could run the photocopy machine. I said, sold. So I ran the photocopy machine for three weeks. I could barely see at the end of these three weeks, you know, the old ones that would go back and forth like this. And I was getting blinded. So one day I stuck my head in the office of the general counsel and I said, you know, I'm a college graduate. I know how to read. Is there any job you can give me? He said, sure, come on in. We'll make you paralegal. So probably the best job I ever had. And uh, I give Dartmouth a lot of credit. And President Kennedy did an extraordinary job running that commission with a very important report that came from it that I think fundamentally changed our approach to nuclear power, particularly from the regulatory standpoint. Anybody know what this airplane is? Wow. Some people actually know. This is called Solar Impulse. This is a solar-powered airplane. It's been under development for 10 years, $180 million, 80 companies, a European-based project. I was lucky to get involved with this project last winter. The plane just finished a flight from San Francisco to New York. Totally solar powered, wingspan of a 747, 12,000 solar cells, weighs what a VW bug weighs. 747 weighs what a VW bug weighs. Pretty amazing. The guy who came up with this idea was the first man to fly a balloon around the world. His father was the first to dive to the bottom of the Marianas Trench, and his grandfather was the first guy to fly a balloon into the stratosphere. This is an amazing feat of technology. Solar meets lightweight materials, meets advanced batteries. The big airline maker said it couldn't be done. The couldn't be done was flying this thing through the night and having enough power in the batteries that when you got to the sunrise the next day, it could charge itself in the air. It proved you can do it. And in theory, this thing could fly forever, except the pilots have to go to the bathroom occasionally. I was very inspired by this because, not because you're going to be flying a, a United Airline solar powered from New York to San Francisco anytime soon, but so many practical technologies are being brought down literally from the air to, to the ground. Already advanced installation for refrigerators, advanced materials for wind turbine blades, a whole host of things. It is also an inspiring project. I, my, my then nine-year-old, now 10-year-old, just about peed in his pants when he met the pilots and got to see this plane. Kids love this. Silicon Valley tech people love it. The politicians in Washington who got to see it love it. This has been a very inspiring project, and I've been proud to be a part of it. So my three lucky chances in my career, one, two, three, you just heard a bit about those. Let's dive in to this talk. I've got a lot of slides, but I'm going to run through them quickly and give you a flavor of my approach to clean energy policy and finance. I've always loved this quote, the future is not what it used to be. And when it comes to energy and climate, that is the case in so many ways. From the Gulf oil spill to the Fukushima reactors to this amazing drop in the price of natural gas from more than $10 a thousand cubic feet in 2008 to under $3 a cubic thousand cubic feet in 2012. Unbelievable drop has had very fundamental implications for how we make and use energy in this country. Obviously the rise in carbon emissions and a massive increase at the same time in investment in clean energy technologies. Interestingly, led by the Chinese, second the Germans, the third our own country. We are not number one in terms of that kind of investment. And now, of course, Hurricane Sandy and all that that's taught us, told us about the climate problem. I've always loved the New Yorker and their humor. Sorry, Harold, but I'm reducing our carbon footprint. So, 
If the future is not what it used to be, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And I think that's what's so extraordinarily exciting about this world of, of clean energy and clean energy technology. And just, just focus on this one number. The International Energy Agency has said we're going to spend roughly $38 trillion on energy infrastructure between now and 2035. $38 trillion. Whether we do that clean, dirty, or somewhere in between, there's big money that's going to be spent, huge opportunities to both do good and to do well. That is an amazing number. Our country is going to have a big piece of that, a medium piece of that, or a small piece of that. All this is in our own hands. It's going to have a lot to say about the climate problem, about energy security, about U.S. competitiveness. So what are the key elements of a sustainable energy future? If you only take one thing from this talk, please remember this triangle. If we are going to get to a more sustainable energy future, it's going to take a combination of serious advances in technology, smart policies, and massive amounts of capital. You just saw that capital number in the last slide. We've got to get smart at each point of that triangle, and as I said to the students an hour ago, we've also, as we specialize in one of those, we have to also understand the other two. I think too often the technologists think if you invent it, it will happen. In the energy world, often that doesn't happen because the policies aren't aligned or the capital doesn't follow. Technologies, policy, and finance. The technology pipeline starts with an idea, many ideas. We spend money on R&D. We do some initial small-scale demonstrations. We build a little pilot plant. We see if we can actually deploy, deploy this in a, in a modest way. Then we get to the big challenge, which is commercializing it. How do you take an energy technology from point which it works at pilot scale and get it to a point at which it works at full scale with all the time required in that and all the capital required in that. I'll talk about that a bit in a little, in a few minutes. We're not going to go through all of these, but there are many, many policies at the federal level, even more at the state and local level. From early stage federal R&D funding, you've heard about the loan guarantee program, there are tax credits, and there are these things in italics that we haven't gotten to yet in this country. Maybe a carbon price, maybe cap and trade, maybe a clean energy standard, and then something called the Clean Energy Deployment Administration. So technology, policy, and finance. And the players are these three in particular. Sometimes they don't talk to each other very well. Sometimes they don't understand each other very well. And I think we suffer the consequences of that. Wall Street not totally understanding Washington and too often not respecting Washington and things in reverse, and Silicon Valley often scratching its head about the East Coast. So we have an, almost an anthropological issue, too, in dealing with this and trying to advance these technologies. Our center, which is based at both the law school and the business school at Stanford, is really trying to work at this intersection between policy and finance, policy to set the stage, and finance to make things happen. All along that technology spectrum I showed you, from R&D all the way to full-scale deployment. How do you bring money across that entire spectrum from both the private and the public sectors? There are really only six strategies. Somebody may have a seventh, and I'd love to hear it when we get to Q&A. There's really only six strategies when you come right down to it for how we're going to improve our energy system. The stationary energy source, cleaner electricity, modernizing the grid, and efficiency in transportation, alternative fuels like ethanol, plug-in cars, and the like, and increasing vehicle efficiency. So we do have a fairly narrow range of strategies that we then have to apply this triangle of technologies, policy, and finance to. So efficiency first. My view, 
That's the place to start. I always loved what Amory Lovin says, all people want is cold beer and hot showers. We want the services, if we can do it with less energy, let's do it that way. And too often, we're not. A very complicated chart, but this is the famous McKinsey cost curve. This is the relative cost of various approaches to fixing the climate problem from the expensive stuff Industrial CCS means carbon capture and storage. That's the expensive end of things. Coming down from there, uh, cellulosic ethanol, some of you have heard of that. But then you get down to here, the low cost, no cost, negative cost stuff, and it's the really boring things like insulation and lighting and air conditioning and water heating and fuel efficient vehicles. That's the low cost, no cost. People talk about energy efficiency as the low-hanging fruit. I add to that, it's low-hanging fruit that grows back because we're always inventing new energy efficiency technologies. And here's an example. Some of you or your parents or your grandparents still have that 1970s refrigerator sitting in the basement or in the garage still running. That 1970s refrigerator uses almost 2,000 kilowatt hours a year. By law today, you can't use more than about 400, and the standard recently got even lowered further. When I was assistant secretary, we set that 2001 standard. It was, my, it, was a, it was a great day for me because we had a press conference um, about this standard. Not one of the more exciting things in Washington, but a few press people showed up. And uh, the energy secretary at the time, Bill Richardson, said, Riker, what should I get up and say? He said, I said, well, Mr. Secretary, last week the president gave his inaugural, I'm sorry, his State of the Union speech in which he talked about building a bridge to the 21st century. Why don't you announce we're building a fridge to the 21st century? <laughs> it was the quote of the week in Newsweek. It was my greatest day as a bureaucrat. <laughs> Three weeks later, we were issuing the new washing machine standards, even more boring. So he gets up there and he says, Riker, what am I going to say now? And I said, well, Mr. Secretary, why don't you announce that we are agitating for change? <laughs> he says, no, you do that one. All right. If you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. I always love this statement from Lord Kelvin. ET, energy technology, meets information technology. This is an extraordinarily exciting intersection in the energy world right now. How many of you know much of this? How many kilowatt hours you use each day? What time of the day you use the most? What appliances use the most? And what are your best energy saving options? Most of us don't know this. At Google, we created something called the Google Power Meter, which would tell you in real time how much energy you were using. We had a little meter on our kitchen counter. One day, my little son came down, and he put some bread in the toaster, and he said, look, Daddy, it went from 400 to 1,100 from 400 watts to 1,100 watts. I said, yeah, that's how a toaster wa works. And when the toast pops up, it'll go back to 400. He ran around the house for half an hour, plugging things in and running down to the kitchen. And I swear to God, he knew more than 90% of Americans a half an hour later. We don't know much. Google did not go forward with this product, unfortunately, despite some interesting things, like began using Google Power Meter yesterday, decided it's time to buy a more efficient clothes dryer today. But there's a wonderful race going on in venture-backed companies trying to develop this technology, giving people real-time information that they can act on in their homes and get a better sense about some of that data. So finance meets policy. I want to talk about three challenges we've got right now, and I'll walk through these quickly, and then we can take some questions. First is increasing the availability of capital. Second is cutting the cost of capital for renewable energy. And the third is improving investment in commercialization. Remember that point along the technology spectrum. So energy investment, energy efficiency investment opportunity. Deutsche Bank says, very well regarded bank, we could save a trillion dollars in this country over 10 years. We'd have a $300 billion investment opportunity in doing that. Big numbers. The problem is 
not much capital is flowing, despite the fact there's this big energy savings investment in our commercial and residential buildings, very little money is flowing. 3% of commercial space is renovated each year, but only a tenth of these include state-of-the-art energy efficiency upgrades, and it's even worse in our homes. Granite counters, tops in the kitchen, all sorts of new things in the house, but we really don't rarely go into the basement to replace that 40-year-old furnace. Two problems, low consumer demand and investor concerns about risk. So what the president said, I know the idea may be not very glamorous, although I get really excited about insulation. It's sexy stuff. Hmm. The president does. I don't think too many other people do. Um, so more seriously, a specialist at one of the US labs said the following, this is fundamentally a demand challenge. People just don't care that much about their energy use. Lots of ways to stimulate demand. We could make the business case to owners, and some things are happening in that regard. Some countries actually mandate efficiency retrofits. You sell a building, you've got to upgrade it. Or even if you haven't sold it, you've got to upgrade it. We don't generally do that in this country. Requiring disclosure of energy use. And this, this interesting one that, that I'll talk about for a second. Incorporate energy performance in real estate appraisal and mortgage underwriting. It sounds kind of wonky, but let me give you the quick details. When you get your home appraised before getting a mortgage, they have to look at all sorts of things. Termites, lead paint, soil, health, water, topography, but not energy use. You know, are the termites eating up the beams in the attic? Got to know that. Is the furnace chewing up dollars in the basement? Don't need to know that. That's not part of the appraisal. Mortgage underwriting. Folks who know real estate know these are the four pieces of underwriting. Underwriting means getting approved for a mortgage, getting reviewed for a mortgage. Principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. Why don't we include the cost of energy? Because sometimes that's, many times, that's actually more expensive than either the insurance or the taxes. A place like this, cold in the winter, sometimes hot in the summer, you can spend a lot more on energy than you do on home insurance or taxes. So, good news. Legislation's been introduced, was introduced in 2011, to change this. It would basically say to the Department of Housing and Urban Development, set standards that have to be met when you go to appraise a home and when you go to underwrite a mortgage that reflect this. It had some good initial support, but it stalled. The bill was recently introduced. It was somewhat pared back, not fatally, but somewhat and it now has the support of the major real estate organizations in the country, which it didn't have before. And it might actually get attached to a pending piece of energy efficiency legislation called the Shaheen Portman Bill. Remember that name, Portman, I will come back to it. Right, Celia? All right, so it might move. This bill might come up this month, and this might get attached to it, and we might actually have this happen. Not much legislation like that happens in Washington these days, so this could be a nice step forward. So the other issue, I said that investors or lenders are reluctant. Why are they reluctant to invest in energy efficiency in your home or your commercial building? Well, sometimes the borrower isn't credit worthy. They can't be sure they're going to get paid back. Often the engineers tell them, you make these changes and you're going to get this 30% reduction in energy, but guess what? Sometimes you only get 20% performance risk. And there are cases, not that many, where you make these changes and the actual building is worth less. It might be hotter in the summer, colder in the winter. You might have to narrow the walls because you're putting in more insulation. There's, there's sometimes cases where you actually compromise the value of the building. Not too often. These are the bigger ones. Lots of ways people are working on to deal with this investment risk problem. One, this is complicated, but essentially this says Instead of having to pay up front the $25,000 to make the improvement in my home or the $250,000 in my commercial building, I can actually put the cost of that on my property tax and pay it back over a long period of time. There's another approach where you put it on your monthly energy bill and pay it back. And that would, that would do some good things in terms of barriers to these kinds of investments. You don't have to pay up front with a big lump 
some check, you can pay it off over time, either on your property tax or on your monthly energy bill. <laughs> now, there is one place where people do know a lot about energy, and that's the cost of filling up their car. That's the one place. People know it down to pennies. They will drive miles out of the way to save two cents a gallon. I love this slide. We provide on-site home refinancing to help out with gas purchase. <laughs> now, this one was particularly relevant to me because 10 years ago, my third child was born in the front seat of an old Volvo at a Shell station in Waterbury, Vermont. Is my wife here? Maybe that's why she didn't come. <laughs> this was quite a story. The good news is it all came out just fine. Um, here he is 10 years later. We went back to the gas station <laughs> a week ago. His name is Graham, but his nickname is Car's Son. You can groan. That's OK. So that's Carson. I couldn't convince my wife that we should name him that. But it is his nickname. Anyway, policy. I think the biggest thing our president has done to date when it comes to energy and climate policy is push through these new standards for automobile fuel economy, which will, by the middle of the next decade, by 2025, push automobile fuel economy to 54 and a half, 55 miles per gallon. That's a huge, huge step forward when it comes to fuel savings, carbon reductions, oil security. So this was a big, big, big step forward. Um, and we're hopeful that this second term of his, he will do some equally momentous things. And I'll, I'll mention that in a second. Now, that's probably not the approach to a more efficient car. Um, not going to work. But, but Obviously, this emerging world of plug-ins um, really is beginning to, to take hold. Not as quickly as some would have thought or some would have hoped, but these cars are getting, are getting uptake, both hybrid gas electric plug-ins and pure electric plug-ins. At Google, we worked on some technology the company's not working on any longer, but others are, which would basically allow a car to talk to the electric grid. So in California, we have a situation, for example, where we have lots of wind energy at night when we least need it. If we had a million or two million plug-in cars plugging in at night, they could fill up with this otherwise low-value wind energy. And the next day, as we've seen in the last few weeks in California, the Central Valley is 110 degrees. The electric system is being pushed to its limits. New Old coal plants have to go online to meet that demand. Not a good thing. With a smart system, a signal could go out to those cars plugged in at work. Remember that cheap electricity you bought last night? We'd like a quarter of your battery today, and we'll pay you three times as much as you paid last night. And you wouldn't even have to make this decision. This was something you'd sign up for. It might be an eighth of your battery. Or you might say, I don't want to do it, even though I'd make 3x. We're at a point now where we can do these sorts of things at this intersection between information technology and energy technology. And that's why it remains a pretty exciting area for the venture capital investors in Silicon Valley, around Boston, and, and elsewhere. So we could get to a point of this so-called smart grid with renewables, advanced transmission and distribution, a smart home, and a plug-in vehicle. A lot of these things talking to each other in a way they haven't before. And I saw this in my neighborhood. Driving a hybrid is great. Living in one is better. And that's the sort of place we could be moving towards that I think is very exciting. And again, it really has to be a merger of technology, policy, and finance. Because a lot of the policy here comes down to decisions by the state public utility commissions. And there are 50 of them in the United States. And they all make very different decisions that in some places will enable things like this to happen, and in other places will not. So second challenge. We've seen big cost reductions in renewable energy. 
as many of you know, the price of solar panels has dropped dramatically, the price of wind turbines, other technologies. PV panel prices have dropped almost 75% in the past three years. So there's lots of complicated explanations for that, but big time drop. But, but these technologies still cannot compete straight up with traditional technologies, particularly natural gas and coal. And interestingly, the cheapest of all, energy efficiency. But they can't compete yet, even though we've seen these big drops. So great news, big drop in the cost of technologies. Not so good news is that the cost of financing renewable energy projects has remained stubbornly high. So the equipment costs have come way down, but the cost to finance the projects has not. So as a result, financing costs today make up an ever greater fraction of the overall cost of a project. The cost of the equipment has gone down, but the cost of finance has stayed high, so it's a bigger and bigger proportion. So what's the problem? Well, one of the major causes of the problem is that we rely on what are called tax credits to finance renewable energy projects in the United States. They turn out to be a high cost and pretty unreliable way of financing renewable energy. They only have only short-term congressional approval. Some of you may remember last year that the wind energy tax credit just about ran out. It was saved in the middle of the night when the, in the middle of the fiscal cliff negotiations. But it was only put back on the books for one year, and it's going to run out again at the end of this year. There's only a very small group of investors who can use tax credits. They actually have to have big, big profits that they want to shelter from taxation. My former employer, Google, is one of those that's made very good use of tax credits in financing wind projects. But there aren't that many companies that situated in that way. The, the way you have to set up the corporate structures to build a big energy project means that you get taxed at the level of the corporation and at the level of the individual. So you get taxed twice. And when you make an investment in one of these projects, it gets tied up for a long period of time. We call it illiquid. So on the order of eight to 10 years before you can get your money back out. Now, there's a totally different way that the traditional energy industry in the United States has financed its growth. The largest mechanism are what are called master limited partnerships and increasingly something called real estate investment trusts. These are simpler investment structures. They trade like stocks. So some of you probably have bought stock in an oil and gas pipeline project or it's in your retirement account and you may not know it. MLPs have financed $400 billion of gas, oil, and coal infrastructure. Big number. And REITs, as we call them, have financed $500 billion of real estate, some of which increasingly includes traditional energy projects like transmission lines. So what we've been proposing in Washington, and we've been providing information and analysis on behalf of this, is something called the MLP Parity Act, which was introduced in the Senate and the House in 2012, was reintroduced this year and expanded. Um, it would make a modest change to the existing law to essentially add renewables to this MLP investment vehicle, because today under the law, renewables don't qualify for that investment structure. We'd also add other kinds of clean energy technologies. It enjoys bipartisan support in the House and Senate, not something you can say is very common these days. That's the good news. The less good news is that we're still searching for a, quote, legislative vehicle to which this could be attached. This is not going to be voted on as a freestanding piece of legislation. So there's various ways that this could move forward. But it's, an, we think, a, a compelling idea it would level the playing field, as people say, because the renewables and other clean energy technologies would have access to the very same financing structure that much of the rest of the traditional energy industry has used. Real estate investment trusts don't take a change in law by Congress. The Internal Revenue Service can make a ruling adding this, and they've made a series of rulings over the years, the latest being to say cell towers 
can be financed using a real estate investment trust. We've said, hmm, what is a cell tower? It's a big tower. Put a turbine on it, turbine blade, and you got a wind turbine. How big a difference is that? And we're making some progress getting the IRS to, to, to issue an administrative ruling that would do that. Bottom line, we could cut the cost of electricity from renewable energy projects by as much as one-third. I, I want to emphasize by as much as. We're not saying by one-third. But there are, there are a number of situations by it would be by as much as one-third. Now, very quickly, beyond the cost of capital, of course, is a price on carbon, as, as, as most of you know. Lots of ways to do this. One is directly through a tax. And then there's all sorts of indirect ways. Cap and trade, which was working its way through the House and Senate a few years ago, but is going nowhere fast now. Something called the Clean Energy Standard, which would have set a standard across all energy technologies for certain percentages of US energy to, produce, to be produced from each of those technologies. But most likely these days is what the president made a big push on behalf of two weeks ago, which is carbon emission standards for both new excuse me, and even more importantly, existing power plants. The Supreme Court said in 2007 that EPA has the authority to set these standards. The agencies began that in the previous administration. The, president Obama's first administration, I should say, and the president in his climate speech two weeks ago said, get moving. We, we want to get these done by the end of this administration. They will probably be challenged in court. But I think with the Supreme Court having given EPA this authority, and if EPA does a good job in putting these together, um, I think ultimately these um, will prevail. The other wild card, of course, is natural gas. Plentiful and cheap. You saw that dramatic price drop uh, in the opening. The president talked about us as the Saudi Arabia of natural gas. Uh, so we have a lot of it. And the question is, how much are we going to use and how are we going to use it? This is that same chart. But the question is, how long will these prices remain low? And I heard someone recently say, the only thing we can be sure about the price of natural gas is that we can't be sure about the price of natural gas. We've seen large swings in the price of natural gas over decades. It's down pretty low. It has come up somewhat since that very low point in 2012. But the question is, is it going to go up a lot? Some? And that'll have a lot to say about how much natural gas driven energy we're going to use, how quickly renewables come in, how much efficiency gets focused on, other technologies like nuclear, how much of new production from those technologies occurs. So this is a big deal. Um, one of the issues, of course, is fracking. I assume all of you have heard of fracking and, um, and know that there are a whole set of environmental issues. I think the industry is working through these. I think it remains to be seen whether we will successfully work our way through all of these. But I think you know, there's very substantial work going on with respect to each of these issues. And um, time will tell. And there is, I think, the potential for what some have called an attractive marriage. Natural can f gas can firm up intermittent renewables. The sun doesn't always shine. The wind doesn't always blow. So often you have to fire up a natural gas generator to provide balance in the system. But renewables can reduce the price volatility of natural gas. The sun is free. The wind is free. So there's a little bit of a complementarity there. And if you combine that with energy efficiency and energy storage, there's potentially a pretty good, pretty good marriage there. But we've got to work our way through a variety of issues across many of these sources, including natural gas. So last challenge. You saw this earlier, and I want to finish up talking about commercialization. So there is this risk versus capital equation that we think about in the energy investment world. And that is to say, venture capital, the early stage investors in an energy technology, 
tolerate high risk, but put in relatively small amounts of capital. They'll say, here's 500,000 or a million, or here's 5 million or 10 million. Go see what you can do in the early stage of moving this technology forward. At the other end is the world of what we call project finance, where you have a well-proven technology. It's been deployed at full scale, and that's where large amounts of capital are spent, but on low-risk projects. They've already been proven. In between is what we call the valley of death. And this is an area where lots and lots and lots of energy technologies die. Energy technologies are expensive to bring to market, often have very long time frames involved that can be measured in decades. And so this is a big challenging area where lots and lots of technologies don't make it. Some because they shouldn't make it, but others because they don't have the care and feeding that they need. So fracking, little known story, and I apologize for this graph. It's a hard one to see. But it's been about six, taken about 60 years to cross the valley of death when it comes to fracking. Horizontal drilling had to meet hydraulic fracturing, had to meet seismography. The government got involved in a whole host of ways, many, many, many billions of dollars. And when all of this came together technically, guess what we had? We had a spike in the price of natural gas. So it was a great time to be using this technology. There was big money to be made just as the technology was ready for market. But 60 years and many billions of dollars. The nuclear industry, how many years have we been at it? Post Hiroshima and Nagasaki, you know, Admiral Rickover and the nuclear navy, we went from there to Atoms for Peace. We've been at it for 60 years, 70 years. Many, many tens of billions of dollars that the government has spent to bring this technology market. The solar industry, 50, 60 years we've been at it. These technologies take a long time. Google was fascinating for me. I'd watch these folks sit down at keyboards. They'd write a new piece of code, take a few months, cool little team. They'd say, it works. We're ready. Let's go test it. And as I said to the class, I was one of the testers because I was the least IT savvy person that's ever worked at Google. <laughs> um, so if it worked on Riker, it's ready. So they'd press the button, they'd deploy it, and a year later, you know, 100 million users. They measure things in months and millions of dollars. In the energy world, we measure them in decades and billions or tens of billions of dollars. That is the valley of death. So that's fracking. The first cousin of fracking, I like to call it, is something called enhanced geothermal systems. Some of you know that geothermal traditionally is you drill down deep into a pocket of steam or hot water, you bring it up, and you fire a turbine and make electricity. This is where you drill down deep. There's no water down there, but you crack the rock because the rock is very hot. And you pump water down there as you would with fracking. You bring it back up. So you're introducing water into this regime. It used to be called hot, dry rock. It's, we've been at it for a few decades. It's got some real promise, but there's lots of risks. It is in the valley of death right now. Whether it will make it out the other end really remains to be seen, because it doesn't have the funding sources that some of these other technologies that I've mentioned have enjoyed. But it's a big opportunity. 2% of the EGS resource in Texas, 2% would produce 177,000 megawatts of power. The entire installed base of generation in Texas is 100,000 megawatts. Still a long way to go with this, to take it to full commercial scale. But it's promising. But the question is, will it get through the valley? Approaches to advancing commercialization. There's the Federal Loan Guarantee Program. There's a proposal called CETA, private sector, and China. The loan, gu loan guarantee program, unfortunately, has gotten too associated with Solyndra. Um, many of you know this story. But there's actually a variety of loan guarantee programs. We've spent $40 billion or so on loan guarantees in this country um, across an array of programs and projects. 
the Wall Street Journal has been very critical of this loan guarantee program and particularly of Solyndra. But various reviews that have been done have basically said to date that at least so far the whole portfolio of loan guarantees that the federal government make, has made has performed reasonably well. The jury is still out, but it may be that as taxpayers, these investments by the federal government will turn out to be modestly or significantly positive. We don't know that yet. But it has been the program that has helped push these commercialization projects forward. That's been the primary policy tool that we've had at the federal government level. There probably are better ways to do this, though, than the loan guarantee program. And these are some of the lessons learned. I won't, I won't spend time on that. But one of the proposals that's been made and has worked its way through the Senate is called the Clean Energy Deployment Administration. It would focus exclusively on the valley of death. It would be authorized with $10 billion, and the thought is that it could leverage $100 billion. That's not small dollars. Unlike most government programs, CETA could actually take a piece of the profits in the investment. And that would be a real change. And it would enjoy some independence from the Energy Department, which probably would be, arguably would be a healthy thing. There was a bipartisan bill in the Congress, but it doesn't seem to be moving. So we've pretty much discounted that one. We've been working on some private sector commercialization, purely private sector commercialization vehicles at Stanford. Um, we'll see where those go, but we got funded by the Electric Power Research Institute to look at whether there are ways to leverage only private capital to get some of these things done. And lastly, the biggest source of commercialization opportunity are probably the Chinese. As we've pulled back as a country, the Chinese have moved forward very, very aggressively into this clean energy area. Um, measured in terms of raw investment, and these numbers are somewhat out of date, and I think the spreads are even bigger now. Um, we still spend more in the R&D area. That's, that's our real ace in the hole. But the Chinese are investing huge amounts right now. And buyouts and investments. This is just a, a sampling of the US companies across a whole array of technologies, some of which, by the way, were financed by the federal taxpayers through R&D and the Loan Guarantee Program. So an interesting perspective. China has rapidly overtaken the US in green technology because of a coordinated national response, not because Chinese businesses alone invested in green technology. Remember that $38, billion, $38 trillion figure I showed you? I think there's been a decision in China that they really want to have the lion's share of that. Now, from a climate perspective, you could definitely argue that whoever can figure out how to advance clean energy technologies, that would be a big step forward for climate. From a US competitiveness standpoint, that's not the same situation. From a job standpoint, arguably from an energy security standpoint. So we need to think long and hard in this country about where we want to end up with this $38 trillion market that we're staring at right now. What piece of it are we going to own? What do we need to do? And how do we find areas of complementarity with the Chinese? This should not just be a raw battle. It should not be like the current one based on trade sanctions around solar panels and wind turbines. There should be a more thoughtful areas of complementarity and areas of competition. The Germany has also said and is moving to have a big chunk of this $38 trillion, as are other countries as well. So I got to go to China in 1984 with a close Dartmouth friend. Um, and we got to paddle through the three gorges of the Yangtze, where the single largest hydroelectric power plant in the world was built. In fact, I think it's the single largest electrical generating plant in the world, 22,500 megawatts, compared to a large nuke, which is about 1,000 megawatts. This thing is big. So we got to paddle through the three gorges before that was built. It was an extraordinary trip. 
I tell you that not to take you on a travel tour, but the guy in the front is my dear friend Rob Portman, who's now the senator from Ohio, sits on the Senate Energy Committee, and it is the Shaheen Portman bill, Senator Shaheen from New Hampshire, a Democrat, and Rob Portman, a Republican, who are moving this energy efficiency bill through the Senate right now, to which we hope will be attached this bill that I mentioned about appraisal and mortgage underwriting. And it's been fun testifying occasionally in the Senate Energy Committee in front of your old kayaking buddy, particularly when he slips you funny notes and it's a little hard to keep a straight face. And anyway, so technology, policy, and finance, if I leave you with one thing, it's what I left the students with. Whether you're a student or a professional, I think we all have to be very skilled as much as we can at one point of that triangle, but we've really got to do our best to understand the other two points of the triangle if we really want to move this whole clean world of clean energy forward. Too often we get stuck here, we don't understand the other two, and I think that's really, really hampering progress. So whether you're studying here at Dartmouth as a student, whether you're doing your best as a professional, uh, got to work our way around this triangle. And I will leave you with that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions, please. Yes, please. Uh, I'm sorry, I came in a little late, so I don't know for sure. You mentioned one of either of two things. First, carbon dioxide and its effect on global warming. No. Well, at the current rate of carbon dioxide generation, within a decade, New York City will be under at least five feet of water. Our goal has got to be to cut CO2 to zero as fast as possible. Because the, and the fiddling around of the president is silly. The, the Arctic ice cap is melting at a tremendous rate, and the sea level rises. I did show the picture of Hurricane Sandy, and I think that came home loud and clear, folks. The second issue Please. is, did you mention hydrogen fuel? I did not. Every car company in the world is building hydrogen fuel. And if you didn't mention it, it's not your fault. The entire profession of professors who study this, and I'm a professor here at Dartmouth, but I'm a political scientist, so I don't know a damn thing about technology, right? The entire academic community has ignored hydrogen fuel but every car company is making the cars. You can buy them now. GM started a high, uh, and they zero CO2. You so Professor Masters, Professor Masters, I, I, I guess I'd say this. Um, I, I, am, I am not a technologist. I, I've learned some at that one point of the triangle where I focus on policy and finance, but I will say this. What I do know is there's hydrogen and there's hydrogen. Um, there are more, there are better and worse. So one, one sentence. July 5, 2010, MIT, solar panel, electricity, split water. Right. It comes out of the tank. Okay. No, it's now feasible because they bring a different technology. Exxon Mobil is not making hydrogen fuel. So let me just say, I'm, I'm a believer in all comers. If, and if we can do this, if we can figure out the technology for hydrogen and if the policies are right, and if the capital flows, let's go with hydrogen. Uh, I'm, I'm agnostic, whatever it takes, but... I, I suggest you just look at what Exxon Mobil is doing with their new plant. No, no, I, 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 I don't disagree in the slightest that, that hydrogen needs to be part of the equation, but, and there's a very healthy race going on technologically, and I think that's all to our benefit. Please. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to add another point to your triangle, make it a square. Please. I've even had a Pentagon, too. We're in the right building, actually, for discussion of this. And that is called human behavior and how people respond to the policies and technology. I recently received a report that with the advent of uh, very efficient and low-cost uh, lighting systems, people were actually using more <laughs> than less. They found that it's cheaper. They left the lights on. They no longer cared about it. And I have many other stories, one of them which is really unbelievable. I went to South America, and when you register a hotel, you get a card. 
When you go to your room, you put the card in, turns all power on. Travel throughout the United States, see where you get a card. Everything's on and consuming electricity constantly. So we're really doing a lousy job of educating people and getting to, to respond. In a, and that is as much of a challenge, I feel, because it's uh, neuropsychology and the new science of how the mind works. That, your, your response to that? No, I, it, it's, a, it's an important aspect of all of this. Um, it, it deserves attention in and of itself. Some technologists will tell you that they can put the right information in front of people so they don't make those mistakes. So that's what the venture world is investing in when it comes to information technology. Or something as simple as the, what you saw in South Africa. You know, make, figure out a way to make money at putting those systems in. Maybe give the hotel a cut and the energy, you know, there's a whole way you could do this. But I don't disagree at all. There is something called, what do we call it, the bounce back or spring back phenomenon when people lower their energy use and they or, you know they start using more there's a whole set of things so I don't I don't I don't definitely don't disagree and um, and uh, maybe I will start adding footnotes because there's been two or three other things people want to add to this and ultimately maybe it's a big circle <laughs> please yes I agree with all three corners are important the one that I'm most discouraged about at the moment is the policy corner uh, because it seems like a substantial fraction of Congress refuses to admit there's any danger. Uh, they call global warming the greatest hoax ever perpetuated in you, uh, so on and so forth. Do you see a way to get past this or around this or uh, avoid it? So there's one way to go totally around it in a sense, and one of the students asked about this in the class earlier, which is the states are doing amazing things. Um, there are 30 states, for example, that have adopted uh, what are called renewable portfolio standards, renewable energy standards. 30 states, Democrat and Republican-led states. And so, and that's in addition to tax credits providing some incentives, that's created some demand for renewables. States have done very important things with respect to energy efficiency. States are increasingly providing creative approaches to finance. Um, and these are states all across the country. You know, California has been a big driver, but so is a state like Iowa in the wind energy area. Connecticut has a very aggressive green bank. The New England states have been doing all sorts of things, including, as you know, setting some, uh, putting in place some climate policy programs. So that gives me some heart. Going back to Washington, I'm, I'm forever an optimist. And my sense is two things. One, on Capitol Hill, look for small and medium things to do. So those two examples I gave you, one MLPs and REITs, and the other uh, appraisal and underwriting, those are small and medium things that you might actually get through the Congress. Senator Portman and Senator Shaheen actually got an energy efficiency bill through the Congress in the last session that President Obama signed. It was not a big deal, it wasn't huge, but they got it through and they may get this second one through. So look for those small and medium things. And the President of the United States has extraordinary administrative authority without Congress to do big things. He didn't go to Congress to set those automobile fuel economy standards. He had been given that authority by Congress and direction by Congress years ago. He has authority to set carbon emission standards, and the Supreme Court, as I said, said he could do that. Now, some in Congress are challenging that, saying he's going around Congress. My view, though, is if the Supreme Court has said you have the authority, a recent Supreme Court, and the Clean Air Act says he should go ahead and do it, as he's, as he's done with many, many other standards, and has many presidents who preceded him have done, he should move forward. He said to the Congress in his State of the Union, if you, do, if you don't act, I will. So he's acting. So I think if you combine what states can do with small and medium things in terms of what Congress can do and the President's own administrative authority, we're not going to get all the way there, but I think we can get part of the way. Anant, great to see you. This is Anant Sundaram, who is a professor, an eminent professor at the Tuck School of Business and one of the few business professors in the United States who actually teaches a course in climate change to business students.
thank you for being here. Um, it's pretty much a global issue and doesn't matter where the molecule of CO2 is generated, whether it's in Chicago or Chennai. Um, and, and arguably, the biggest solution to the problem looking at in the next 30 years is perhaps the emissions avoided from emerging markets economic growth. And, and I'm just kind of, and you get the sense that we've been at this for 30 years and the U.S. is becoming arguably again less and less relevant to the global policy solution. Just think, you know, looking at all of the, um, and, and again, those three legs that you mentioned are critical. What do we need to do? You know, if you could wave a wand, what is the thing at a global level that will move the needle the fastest and farthest? So I think, number one, as a country, yes. So the question is, what could we do to get the rest of the world, particularly the, the developing world, to help them get moving, because the biggest chunk of the climate problem no longer sits here, but is in the developing world. Is that correct? And so number one, I think we have to put our own house in order so that we can speak more credibly to the rest of the world. Um, and I think piece by piece, there's not an overarching cap and trade bill. There's not any of the things we had talked about in terms of the ways to do that. But I think piece by piece, we can put our own house in order so that we can speak more credibly to the rest of the world. And I think secondly, um, I think we've got to do all we can to make sure it's in the economic interest of these countries to act. We can't ask them to act against their own economic interests. We can't ask them to act against their own development, moving standards of living for it that we now enjoy. We've got to figure out ways to let them do good and do well at the same time. That's tricky, as you know well. Um, International agreements can help, as we've seen to some extent. You know, we figured it out with the Montreal Protocol for Chlorofluorocarbons. We figured it out in smaller situations. We figured it out in very different areas, international proliferation, for example, to, to a large extent. Um, I remain optimistic we can figure it out in this area as long as, as long as we ask the developing world to do things that are realistic and not against their own economic self-interest and their own employment self-interest. I am not an expert, though. I have not spent a huge amount of time looking at international climate policy. I've focused much more on this. Two more, Two more please. Yeah, so I'll, let, I'll let you give your magic wand for another answer. Um, if you could, with your magic wand, have Dartmouth do um, a series of things to lead innovation, uh, to showcase uh, change here, what would you have us do? So Dartmouth has a great base to build from in, in, a, in a few regards. One, um, there's really extraordinary work going on here across the college from work on, on technology in the engineering school, in, in biology, even some related areas in the medical school. There's, so the technology piece of the triangle is, is, is well covered. The, Policy piece, the Andrew Samwick is here from the Rockefeller Center. There's very good policy work going on um, in the government department. There's a whole host of things there. And then on finance, uh, both in at Tuck and in the economics department, there's, there's good work going on as well. If I had to say one thing, it's how do we better integrate across those areas? How do we connect these dots? Uh, other universities are working on that, and I think Dartmouth is doing some, but, but could do more in terms of integrating all this. So that's number one. Number two, as you say, the facilities themselves, you know, the greening of the facilities, and I think Dartmouth has stepped forward with a lot of new green construction. Um, but I think, for example, there's creative things that can be done th um, in raising funding from alums. You know, on the development side of the college. There's creative things that can be done taking um, some of the college's endowment money and investing it in various approaches to advancing technology from early stage R&D all the way across that spectrum to full-scale deployment. And lastly, you know, I think it's fun that this is the big green. And uh, I think just our own name demands that we 
do well and do good with things green. So, one more? Yes, ma'am. Considering how important natural gas is right now, and the fact that uh, the fracking industry has a buy when it comes to the Clean Water Act, um, do you see any policy, Do you see any challenge to that exemption to the, on the Clean Water Act, and do you see any threat to fr fracking and the continued uh, high, you know, high extraction of natural so the, gas? So, what, 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 what the question refers to, I think, is that uh, not too many years ago. Um, there was an exemption provided under the Safe Drinking Water Act for fracking. Under the Safe Drinking Water Act, this technology, this process, would have been covered by the federal government as a regulatory matter, but an exemption was provided, and therefore the regulation has fallen to the individual states. And the states are now regulating this for the most part, with some advice from DOE and EPA. and with one big exception, which is fracking on federal lands. And that's where the Interior Department has stepped up and is now developing new fracking standards for any gas development on federal lands, interior lands. To answer your question, um, I think we are going to move forward. I don't see this exemption. I don't see the Congress changing this exemption. Um, I do think, increasingly, we are going to see states needing to be more vigilant in their individual oversight of fracking uh, because I don't think they want to put the future of this technology at risk. They don't want to have problems, whether it's induced seismicity, whether it's water pollution, whether it's waste disposal problems. So there are, there are leading states in terms of smart regulation and there are laggard states in terms of smart regulation of fracking. But, you know, I think we've got to go forward in a way that make sure that all of them are as vigilant as we can be, and I think the federal government can provide advice. And finally, I'd say, I think it's really in the interest of the natural gas industry to make sure this goes well. Because if we have problems, um, this, this, this energy source could be put at economic risk for this, for this industry. So I think it's, it's in the interest of the natural gas industry. And some of the associations Natural gas associations really do realize this and are pressing on their own way. As I said, I think the, the jury is still out, but I'm, 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 I'm relatively optimistic that we will improve the way we do oversight at the state level and we can get to a, an approach to fracking that's um, safer and more environmentally responsible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.